Okay. So um, I do think it's related, these topics of accessibility, the internet, um, and a topic which is fairly um, close to, uh, which I enjoy or which I believe in, is the topic of web standards. And I think that's going to be part of um, what today's discussion uh, hopefully will be focused on. Um, what web standards are, what they enable us to do, and perhaps what we can do with them over you know, the, the course of the next couple of years. Because we're basically building a web, and to be able to access it, we need to have a common platform uh, with which we can talk uh, to each other about. So, um, how does this particular uh, topic in terms of web standards relate to people with disabilities? Um, does, have, have any of you seen people with disabilities using the internet or, access, or using computers? A, a few of you. So some, uh, a large majority not. Okay. So um, interestingly enough, um, it's actually uh, possible um, for people with a wide range of disabilities or abilities rather um, to use the internet and to access it. Um, so just before that, we'll just jump into what are the ranges available. So, um, so we're talking about a term, there's a term which I like to use, which is impairments as opposed to disability. Right? And impairments refer to medical conditions that people may have. Right? You, I can see a whole bunch of you wearing glasses here. Right? Would you consider yourselves disabled? Not anymore. Not anymore? <laughs> yeah, so, okay, now take off your glasses. Right. I don't know the day I got my glasses, they're like, aha, I can see now. There you are. Yeah, so it is, it is um, an important thing. I mean, most of you who need glasses to use the computer would probably agree with me, right? Um, but you wouldn't consider yourself disabled because now you're able to use everything exactly the way anybody else is able to, right? Uh, so you go from having an impairment uh, to being disabled and then to being non-disabled by having uh, this little bit of technology, you know, little bit of curved glass between you and the world. Um, so you, you know, it ranges from being, you know, having glasses, having poor vision, perhaps being colorblind, unable to distinguish between important colors, to being completely blind, right? You have, uh, some people are unable to hear, you know, uh, perhaps you can't hear very well or you're completely deaf, right? Uh, people have different abilities in terms of moving around. So you have uh, physical impairments, which would range from perhaps being temporarily disabled. So for instance, if you broke an arm or if you strained a leg, which is pretty likely on these roads, uh, you might be temporarily disabled for say a couple of weeks. Uh, or you might be using, you might use a wheelchair or you might not have access to one of your limbs, right? So these are the five broad classes of disabilities and they span a wide spectrum. You might have a particular cognitive impairment, right, which could learn from having a dyslexia. I know a lot of people have undiagnosed dyslexia in fact, uh, to perhaps having, uh, you know, being a slow learner, to actually having, say, a, uh, being, having something like cerebral palsy which actually affects, then it's a motor neuron disease essentially, right. Uh, so how does this in fact relate to us, you know, because we're hardly, at least I don't think many of our, many of us are uh, in the medical profession here, right? So how do we actually cater to what is essentially or what uh, is seen to be a medical condition? Right? How many of you are doctors here? And, and the medical sort, not the, the, not the fake sort <laughs> with the PhD thing. So, right? Um, none of us. So we had the body, this body, which was um, the W3C, or the World Wide Web Consortium, which came up with a bunch of standards. They're the ones responsible for HTML, uh, CSS, a whole bunch of others, you know, uh, XML, RDF, the basic building blocks of the internet, the, uh, the URL structure, URLs, etc. It's a public body. Any of us could join, technically. Uh, it's got all the big browser vendors, you know, like Apple, Opera, Mozilla, Google, all of them. And they came up and they created a particular standard which they called the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Right? Which essentially consists of four principles. Right? That's it. Four principles, fairly easy to memorize. 
and a useful acronym. So the first one relates to perception or being able to, uh, I'm not going to say see, but being able to experience. So that's the first principle of the WCAG. You need to be able, all your users, regardless of ability or disability, need to be able to perceive your interface. So it could um, range from, a perception can uh, span a wide uh, range of things. You might be able to see an interface, you might be able to hear an interface, you may be able to feel an interface, right? Uh, there are different ways in which perception can happen. But we need, as developers, as designers, we need to actually build our interfaces in such a way that everybody can perceive them. The second principle is uh, they need to be operable. Right? What does operable mean? It basically means the ability to operate it. Right? Uh, to turn on a switch, you need to be able to actually do so. You, if you need to open a door, you need to turn a door handle. In the same way, controls on the internet need to be accessible to everybody. You need to uh, be able to uh, select your gender in a sign-up form. You need to be able to put your name in when the people ask you for it. Right? Um, you need to be you need to be able to use, say, a navigation uh, menu. You need to be actually able to uh, you know hover over a drop-down menu and select one of the items there. <coughs> so uh, it ranges over those. The third principle that the W uh, the W3C came up with was things need to be understandable. Right? You need to be able to understand what, now that you're able to see it or perceive your interface, now that you're able to operate it and move around it, you need to then be able to understand it. And so they have a bunch of guidelines under this, and they have a bunch of uh, uh, rules for uh, ensuring that your content is understandable. You know, simple things like making sure that the language of your text is uh, declared programmatically. Um, yeah, uh, and then lastly, what they talk about is making robust interfaces. And I think this is a theme which is uh, going to become more and more important as we have, you know, a wide range or a diversity of interfaces to actually use um, any electronic, uh, you know, or in any electronic network. Okay? Uh, these days, you can uh, you can talk to your phone like with. Siri, right, with Apple, Siri, and it will talk back to you. Essentially, the internet is talking back to you. That's one way of interfacing with the internet. You can, you know, now we all have, uh, as I'm fond of saying, we all have the internets in our pocket, right? That's a pretty, um, that's a pretty interesting thing if you think about it, especially if you, you know, were on the internet 10 years ago. They're completely unthinkable. So, essentially, they say that you need to ensure that Things that you build today, things that you design and build today, need to work uh, in the future. They need to work with things that came before. Because there are people, trust me, there's still people on IE6 on Windows ME. Right? I'm sure there's some user. I'm sure some of you who are looking somewhat pained have seen those in your like server logs back there. Right? So you need to make sure that you uh, ensure compatibility with a wide range of devices and with um, uh, what are called user agents, right? A user agent could be either a device that you use to access the internet or it could be devices which plug in and allow people to use the internet. Right, so then there's a bunch of guidelines which I do not want to get into, but I do want to show you perhaps um, uh, one example of ways in which uh, people with disabilities can use the internet. And um, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, I'm just going to show you my display. And so, uh, for instance, somebody who can't see, actually it's ironical that I need to show this to you. Somebody who can't see, for, how, how do you think they would experience an electronic interface? Anybody? Screen readers. Screen readers. Okay, excellent. Does that, is that a familiar word for all of you? <coughs> Anyone? Not familiar? Somebody is saying, yeah? Okay, so let's, let's see what a screen reader looks like. What do you, uh, from the term, from the phrase, it's fairly apparent, right? It looks at your screen and then it reads things out here. So, let's see. I think, I think you should be able to hear. So, uh, it's built into this machine, but you have other ones on different operating systems. 
Um, that's it. It's an older machine. Is it a bug? Say? Welcome to Mac OS X. VoiceOver is running. System preferences, universal access, window, toolbar. Uh, that basically is uh, uh, to show you exactly what is being read up. It's useful. You are currently on a toolbar. To interact with the items on this toolbar, press Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. Right. Control, Option, Shift, Down Arrow. Interact with toolbar. Four items, Back, Button. So somebody who can't see, for somebody who can't see, this is a means of accessing a computer. You actually listen to what's happening, and you can, you know, you can navigate your user interface. button. You can navigate your user interface just by uh, moving through this. Search, search text field. And you'll notice that as I move through a diversity of like uh, interface elements, you are currently on a text field. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gets a little uh, verbose sometimes. Um, as you navigate through different interfaces, it'll actually announce exactly what kind of element there is there. So it said, for instance, here, I don't know if you heard that. Show, search, search text field. It actually tells you there's a text field, which implies that you can enter something. You, know, so you, can you are currently on a text field. Yeah. A, F, A, R, A, F, A, A, A. So it, System prep, prefer, prefer. Right, so. You, Keynote, Finder, Google Chrome, Text Mail, Adobe, Adobe Photoshop, CS5, right. System Preferences. So. Um, you'd be able to um, use entire websites just with, the, I'm not online now, so I can't actually demo that, but uh, you can actually move through, navigate, interact with, uh, and, you know, uh, give your, uh, put details into web pages using tools like this. So this is, for instance, an, an example of assistive technology, which a, uh, which somebody who can't see would use. Right? So that's one quick thing. Um, I'm going to turn that off. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction to web accessibility. Um, do you have questions about this? Uh, anyone? Do you want to show us how it's defined on a web page? Uh, yeah, sure. So I can, um, if you want, uh, I, uh, yeah, since we're all developers here, we can talk a little bit about the technology that um, goes into this. Um, it's actually very, very simple. That's an interesting question. How many of you here are designers and not developers? So quite a few. Will you get yeah. scared if you see code? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like code. Anyway, but, um, yeah, so, uh, in fact, HTML is very easy to make accessible. Um, and it really, all it involves doing is to make sure that you apply uh, your common sense to uh, your work. Uh, basic principles. In fact, it's all about going back to the basics. It's about making sure, for example, that your code validates, right? Um, making sure that you write well-formed HTML. Making sure that you use the appropriate HTML um, tags when you're trying to add semantics to a document. It makes. It means um, associating, uh, for instance, naming all your elements. So for example, if you have input fields, you need to be, you need to describe them. You need to say that this is where you put your first name, this is where you put your second name. You need to make sure that you associate uh, labels and controls. Um, so let me see if I have some. Are you, are you guys, do you guys want to see this? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, so we, we can go ahead. Um, what, um, yeah, I'm not going to go through that. Um, no, so I'm just going to jump, sorry, give me a second, I'm just going to jump through to some coding examples. So, yeah. so, 
So, for example, uh, the first guideline refers to text alternatives, right? And making sure, see, text is the most universally accessible form of content that there is. And so, if there are other types of content, for example, videos, audio, uh, interactive elements, the best way to ensure that your content is available to as wide an audience as possible is to make sure that it has text alternatives. So, this is the guideline essentially. It says provide text alternatives for any non text content. Uh, if you have an image, make sure that you have what's called an alt tag for that, which actually describes an image or describes the content of that image in text, right? And um, in fact, accessibility is excellent for business because one of the biggest blind users in the world are your search engines. Google is a huge blind user, right? Google can't see uh, an image. It can't understand an image yet. Anybody from Google want to contradict me on that? <laughs> yeah. As far as I know, Google cannot understand, cannot parse images and understand what's going on there. So you actually have to tell it, okay, this is an image of, in this case, I have selected a yeah. picture of the Prime Minister of India visiting the Ministry of Social <laughs> Justice. Uh, because, for one, they are the ones responsible for electronic accessibility guidelines in India. They are, try, they are trying it with uh, goggles. With Google, yeah. with Google goggles, yeah. yeah. But I think that uh, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. you know, how far along they are with that. No, that's one thing. Doing yeah. one image at a time is a completely different thing, and crawling the entire internet and yeah. understanding those images that's a completely different beast altogether. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wouldn't underestimate them. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> as of now, my anyway, the key point to take away from today is that you should have alt tags on your images. Right? Uh, these describe your images. They're great for search engine optimization. In fact, a lot of your SEO can come from basic accessibility principles, if you like doing that sort of thing. Um, typical sign-up field, yeah, our friends at Google, they ask you for a bunch of inputs, right? They ask you to talk about who you are. They ask you to, they have different controls, they have uh, a whole bunch of things. It's a good idea to associate this input field with this label. So when they talk about your first name, you need a way to programmatically associate uh, these two items together. So you need to, in your HTML, make sure that labels and input elements are associated. So you do that by saying you have your input element which has a unique identifier and you talk about what label, um, uh, the label, what input element the label is for by using the for tag. Right? So fairly basic stuff, if it's all in HTML 101. Unfortunately this isn't followed so closely. Uh, more text alternatives for videos, uh, captures. So, uh, captures are sort of an unsolved problem as far as I remember in the accessibility world. Uh, Google does it by letting you hear a sort of a uh, incomprehensible audio equivalent of a, a text <coughs> or of the capture text. Yahoo allows you to actually call a number. Uh, some of the more newer human understandable captures, I don't know how good they are at stopping spam but they at least are available to everybody. Right? So they will ask you what color is the sky or do a math problem or what not. Uh, have you seen those around yeah, the web? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, of, of course, I don't know at the scale of Google whether those are realistic to put in. Yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, stuff around um, media accessibility which I'm not going to jump into right now. Um, there's also one good, one interesting thing is to make sure that your content is adaptable so that it works on a wide range of devices. Um, you know, so make sure that you pay attention to the semantics of uh, what you're putting on a web page. Use, for example, uh, well-formed markup. Use markup which actually means what you're trying to say. So if you have, um, if you're trying to structure a document, use headings. Use appropriately nested headings. Uh, use tables only for tabular data. I don't know if there are still people. I don't think there are. You'd be surprised. We enough, right? You'd be surprised. I, you'd be really surprised. Um, don't you? Yeah. Uh, people still design websites with tables. It's true. CSS is a little bit hard to get in the beginning, but it's worth making that effort. Right? Um, yeah. Essentially, this is about adding semantics to your document structure. Um, so, uh, anybody want to? Okay, you don't have to tell me if you use tables for designing, but maybe you know a friend. <laughs> yeah? You have a friend of a friend maybe who, you know, a 
admitted once to using a table to design equal height column perhaps. I've no. used about six, seven years ago. I used to. Six, seven years ago. But you've quit now. Have you touched a table sense. since then? I mean, it's not just about the meaning also, it's also about the performance. If you making large pages, tabular structure just screws everything up because it waits for the entire content to load. Absolutely. There are definite performance benefits from going to semantic markup, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, there's guidelines about how to make content distinguishable, about how you use color. Um, so I'm not going to go into these things in detail. Yeah, yeah please, please. <laughs> we don't want people mixing up green and red. You know, people are going to stop okay. doing that. <laughs> okay, okay, using green and red together, Kiran. change the shape. <laughs> Number? Number? 25. Oh, you're, you're not bad. Okay, so... Um, you got the wrong example. You know what I mean, example? Oh, yeah, the projector is helping us out. Maybe the profile, color profile is not correct. <laughs> yeah, that's possible. <laughs> that's quite possible. So, uh, a lot of people, men especially, so most yeah, of us, Yeah, 10% percent of all men cannot see red and blue properly. I mean, sorry, red and green properly. Uh, traffic lights are usually tolerable because they're in order. Okay, you mix up traffic light order, it's bad. But wedge and non wedge, red and green dots are the worst. Okay, I can never tell the difference between what is wedge and what is non wedge in a menu because they're the same damn color to me. You know, so what I do is take a photo of the damn thing and look at the photo because the camera will compensate for the color and make them look separate. <laughs> so please do not make such mistakes. Do not mix red and green. Okay. By the way, uh, you have just been nominated for an entry on first world IR problems. <laughs> in a way, to distinguish the veg and non-veg labels in supermarkets. So, yeah. So. Anyway, so yeah, we this uh, this yeah the guideline is very simple. It basically says you know make it easier for people to see to distinguish between your foreground and your background, right? Uh, so, for example, if I'd used a white background on the slide, it would not have been a good idea to use white text here. So I've used a very dark color. Um, it talks also about the back audio, which is perhaps not so relevant, but basically make sure that the primary audio content is audible and is. Uh, clearly distinguishable from your background. It talks about ensuring that your interface elements and your content is ad has adequate contrast. So it specifies certain ratios for ensuring that uh, there is sufficient contrast between your various bits of text. It also says please allow people to resize text. Right? This is essentially the core of web accessibility. It's about not making assumptions about your users. It's about not making assumptions about the fact that everybody will be able to see 12 point text in light gray on a white background. Right? It's about not making assumptions about the fact that everybody will be able to use a mouse or uh, will have, um, uh, will be able to see your, your interface. Right? If you say, please click on the green button, please click on the red button. Yes, somebody who's colorblind cannot do this. Somebody who's blind can definitely not move through your application. Right? So these uh, that, that's essentially, if I were to wrap up now, um, that would be what I'd ask you to do. Make sure that you don't use, don't make assumptions about the user groups that you're targeting. Right? So, anybody questions? Yeah. Are you aware of any tools which we can run to? I mean, many of the rules that you have said so far can be done. There are some automated accessibility testing tools, um, which, uh, for example, the W3C publishes uh, something called the W3, uh, the HTML and CSS validators, which will do a basic code check and ensure that your HTML is well structured and well formed. Uh, there are tools, there are automated tools which I'm reluctant to recommend because automated accessibility testing is never 100% uh, uh, foolproof. For example, one of the guidelines say make sure that you don't have you have text alternatives for all your images. If you just put blank, 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 blank for all your images, those would be those would technically pass an automated validation test, right? But it would not actually be accessible. So you can uh, the uh, web accessibility in mind publishes a tool called the Wave, uh, called Wave. Uh, I forget how it expands to, but it's a Firefox plugin which you can install. It's also a you can just put your URL into a little bar and uh, it'll indicate whether you have certain errors. It'll also provide alerts for 
things which it can't test it can't test reliably. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, in your talk, you you did a good job of covering the uh, the, the so-called concepts and the theory, right? So, uh, what I was curious was, uh, I mean, if you're aware of the initiatives or the level of awareness, at least in the Indian context of of accessibility and then, you know whether people actually <laughs> care and to what level do they care and whether that's sort of increasing. Sure. Um, well, there are different uh, ways of ac uh, tackling this, um, or ways of looking at this more appropriately. Uh, one is you can look at it as a sort of a, at a, the level of a social phenomena, accessibility. You can look at it from a legal perspective, you can look at it from a business perspective. Those are the three I look at, or I go into looking at. I lost a year of my life trying to get the government of India to pass a policy on electronic accessibility, which became a watered down bill uh, which mandates that all government websites should be accessible to people with disabilities. Um, any of you try to use a government website? <laughs> I think we already talked about I was working on the website for the Central of Physical yes, Disabilities. I'm exactly. not accessible. Exactly. I have to redo the website because of that. Exactly. At least that yeah. website should be accessible. So, so there are efforts. Uh, it's fairly disheartening. There was, uh, okay, so the CIS is a big pusher of electronic accessibility. I uh, did a lot of my work through them. Uh, they recently, in fact, like a couple of days ago, published a study on government websites in India. They did a study of 1,500, and uh, the results are completely unsurprising. Uh, 99, so they, this is the one place where the government of India actually got Six Sigma compliance <laughs> of like, not being accessible. Right? Um, so yes, there's a poli at a policy level, we do have a, cert a little bit of a framework which says you should be accessible. There are no penalties for not being accessible. What's good is that the private sector has a strong motivation to be accessible because it makes good business sense. Writing well-structured structured HTML, um, you know, making sure that your code is uh, you know, optimized for search engines, etc., or accessible, which means that it's SEO. Um, does make good business sense and people are starting to see that. A lot of the frameworks that are coming out have accessibility thought about, uh, people have thought about it at least. So it's becoming better, it's not great yet, but it's it's not as bad as it was five years ago. So, yeah. Uh, can gesture-driven interfaces solve the problem or what's the purpose of that? Um, so gesture-based interfaces have their own set of problems. They've created, you know, they've increased accessibility for particular user groups, most definitely. Um, especially, say, people with different sorts of cognitive disabilities, uh, different sorts of physical disabilities do enjoy gesture-based gesture interfaces. On the other hand, for different sorts of uh, people who are, uh, you know, with different physical disabilities, they may not be able to actually use it, uh, a gesture-driven interface. Um, you can, you know, easily imagine somebody who has uh, poor motor control using an interface like the iPad. Whereas, um, on the other hand, uh, it has been, it has made it far more accessible to people with, uh, you know, who have different sorts of cognitive disabilities because of the <coughs> interface, because of the lack of disconnect between, say, a keyboard and mouse and your screen. Uh, you know, you touch an icon on the iPad, it does something. Right? So that disconnect is removed. So it, yeah, it has its pluses, it has its minuses. Apple is doing some exemplary work in the accessibility uh, sector. They're the first ones who came out with a completely accessible touch screen. Um, I don't know how, what the situation on the Android front is right now, but in Apple, any Apple product, the iPhones, the iPads, are completely accessible. It's actually, it's a huge uh, hit in the blind community for them. You talked a lot about um, mostly content being accessible. Can you yeah. also talk a little about like, which application being accessible, like Gmail or mm -hmm. any of those which are basically um, uh, ARIA. Right? Yeah, so, so uh, in response to, see the thing is web, uh, web standards cannot keep up with the pace of innovation that's happening in the, uh, on the internet, right? So in response to web applications, which are you know, responsive applications, interactive, what are called desktop class applications, you had a new uh, standard or a new um, framework, yeah, ARIA. 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 So it's uh, a web ARIA, which is, stands for Accessible Rich Interfa uh, Internet Applications, which is a bunch of 
rules and a bunch. It's a language for describing uh, 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 repurposed HTML elements uh, and interfacing them with your accessibility APIs. Right? So you can technically make uh, a response uh, or an interactive environment, even like a Gmail chat. Uh, Pretty much everything, Facebook, Google Plus, everybody's becoming like that, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are efforts within it, and uh, they're not they're not doing so badly. There are definitely um, uh, there are definitely issues that these rich internet applications throw up uh, for the accessibility work. So I'm going to stop now because uh, we we will actually try to start on time for the VIP. But before that, before that, the one presentation I was ready to make. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so before we go on, a quick word from our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Hasgeek is a small organization, it's a small community organization which is trying to create discussion spaces for geeks, for everyone actually, not just geeks, we have special exemptions, <laughs> right? Um, everybody's a geek, yeah, at some level or the other. Um, we've, uh, we try and, we're trying to do this by creating you know, a topic that we think people are interested in and having a mechanism for everybody to come together, participate in deciding what gets presented at these events, and uh, then creating online spaces as well for discussion around these. Some of our team members hard at work to try to take their computer away. These are some of the events that we've organized. We did a series on HTML5 a couple uh, months ago, nearly a year last ago. Year. Just last year. Yeah. Exactly, exactly a year ago. Exactly a year ago. Yeah. Doctype HTML5. We then did a quick Android camp, which was on the 1st of April. Um, we did an event called Scaling PHP in the Cloud. Uh, we did, most recently, an event called JSFU, which some of you may have attended, which was about JavaScript and ninjas, I think. I don't understand JavaScript. Our next event, which we'd all like you to come for, and also buy a ticket, <laughs> <laughs> buy a, yeah, is DroidCon. We're pretty excited about this because um, this is uh, the first time that we're going to have an international Android event in <coughs> India. This is a worldwide series of events that's happening, happening in London, Eastern Europe, uh, Germany, Germany, Germany. Other places. Yeah, other places. Netherlands. <laughs> the Netherlands, right. So. so we are the first outside of Europe in the biggest event. So this is going to be our biggest event. It's on the 18th and 19th of November. That's next month, uh, exactly a month from now. And it's going to be in Whitefield. Uh, there's a new convention center up there, which has plenty of space. It's got great sound. Unlike uh, our last venues have had some issues with the sound. Uh, this one should be fun. Uh, it's going to be targeted at Android app developers, people who are interested in the Android ecosystem. So if you are, there's going to be a wide variety of topics, design, development, uh, where Android is going to be going. So please do come and tell your friends and even people you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the event that I'm sure that all of you are going to be far more interested in, and this is the first time we're talking about this, is an event that we would like to call Meta Refresh, okay? which is an event that we're holding early next year. Um, and this is really going to be talking about the future of web interfaces. We're going to be talking about what it means now that we have you know, this wide diversity of devices or ways of accessing it. It's not just about devices anymore. Interfaces are not about devices anymore. Right? Interf uh, interfaces are you know, many and they're just growing all the time. So this was the original iPhone which started a lot of this uh, we're talking about situations where you go from having one way of accessing things, one way of getting at content, to having a wide range of actually getting into stuff. Right? So the big buzzword this year, of course, has been HTML5, which we're going to talk about. Um, but interestingly, they've dropped the 5 from HTML, right? So it's now a standard, it's now an evolving standard, it's changing all the time. Um, things are changing all the time. And as designers and developers, we're doing exciting things. So we'd like to talk about that, and we'd like to invite all of you to come in. Yeah. So this is the future. We have flying cars. So let's, yeah, let's get on with it. Thank you. <laughs>